everybody. It's back with another edition of Our Kids Play Goalie, the spinoff of our flagship show, Our Kids Play Hockey. Got a great guest today, Brad Johnson, uh, who is a very experienced goaltending coach and coach in general. Um, also works for Brian's Hockey, which is a major goaltending equipment company. Uh, we had a great conversation today on many fronts. One was uh, obviously how he got into the position, but we talk a lot of in-depth stuff about how coaches and parents and players can implement goaltending strategies at practice for everybody to benefit. I really love that part of the conversation because he provides us with a lot of resources uh, both in and outside the episode that we can go to to create a better practice plan and make sure that we understand how, how uh, goaltenders should be fitting in to the mix. And then with that said, we also had a great conversation about goaltending equipment uh, about how to properly find it, fit it. Uh, he provided us with a PDF and some information on that as well. So just a lot of great gold in this episode, um, whether you're a goalie parent or not. Uh, so make sure to enjoy it. Again, this is the spinoff of Our Kids Play Hockey. As always, we really appreciate when you share these episodes in your team snaps um, and across the board. Those five-star reviews on wherever you listen to this really does us a lot of good. So thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. Make sure to check out our Facebook page, Our Kids Play Hockey. It's a group on there you can join. It's a private group. We have great conversations in there as well. Well, without further ado, enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Goalie with Brad Johnson. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of the show that has a different skate, different pads, different crease, plays the entire game. It's another edition of Our Kids Play Goalie. Hopefully. And a reminder that while this episode is focused on the netminder position, the objective of these episodes is to better understand goaltending from a 360 approach as coaches, parents, and players. So if your kid is not a goalie, that's okay. You're still going to learn a lot from this episode. Uh, introductions. I'm Lee Elias. I'm joined by Mike Benelli, and we are joined by another extremely qualified individual today to talk about the person and the people between the pipes. He's a USA Hockey Level 5 coach, the associate coach in chief for goaltending in the Michigan Amateur Hockey Association, a mentor coach developer, and is the U.S. sales manager in retail pro and college with Brian's Custom Sports, which for those of you who don't know, is one of the premier goaltending equipment companies in hockey. Hockey friends, please welcome our guest today, Brad Johnson to the show. Brad, welcome to Our Kids Play Goalie. I'm excited to be here. All right, we're excited to have you. So I like to start these episodes with the same question because I think it's always a good one. Uh, you know, some people are voluntold to play the position. Some people have older siblings and you're the one who ends up in net. But how did you get into goaltending? How did that become your your repertoire? Uh, two, twofold. My dad was a goalie um, and he played in the crazy era where you didn't have to where you didn't have a mask when you played net, which oh. always <laughs> made me kind of admire his, his gumption and his toughness. And, uh, and then I was a miracle kid. So I'm, I'm 48 years old. So I had kind of kicked around the skates, but it was really in 1980 when, um, when I really, really got excited about it. Um, and then stuck with it all the way through high school, but, uh, in full disclosure, I'm five foot five, uh, five, six on a good day. No, so, <laughs> uh, as far as my aspirations of, of going above and beyond high school hockey and, and uh, you know, that might, I wasn't that good to be able to make up for my uh, stature. So uh, when I went to Western Michigan uh, in 1992, my freshman year, I, I hung up the the playing skates and immediately got into goalie coaching and coaching at that point um, and really learned how, if you still have the passion for the game, um, you take all your good and bad experiences and then you, you provide opportunities for kids um, coming up and, and try to create a good environment for them. So I got super passionate about coaching. Uh, um, that's almost 30 years ago, 30 years, but now it is 30 years ago. So it's, it's aging me. I got a lot of gray hairs in the beard. So I, I'll tell you this, you know, and, and you said it, uh, not everybody gets to play forever. Actually, none of us do. Uh, but there is, there is future in the game for anybody who really wants it. And I think that that's always a point I like to make is that, you know, when the playing stops, if the passion is there, as you just said, you can continue to be involved in this game. And it is very rewarding most of the time. Um, or for like people like Mike, it's a prison that he's got to operate out of every single day. No, Mike, I'm just kidding. Mike loves it very, very much. But uh, it, is, it is Monday. Yeah. So <laughs> it's Monday morning. Yeah. So Brad, I love that you talked about the Miracle Kid. Quick side story. My brother um, for my birthday just got me a signed Jim Craig uh, uh, shaking hands at the end of the the, the Soviet game. Uh, picture that he he sent to me, which I was blown away by that he did that. But you want to talk about obviously the inspiration of that team um, and a whole generation of hockey players. I'm glad you brought that up because that team deserves every every single ounce of appreciation as hockey people that that we give it. 
Yeah. I, I, and for me too, you know, I was, you know, I was really young. So, um, you know, I, you know, at that age, you don't really appreciate necessarily why it was such a big deal. You just knew how much it was a big deal and you kind of fed off that energy. Right. And it's why I've really enjoyed in later years going back and watching all the documentaries and, and all the really good movies that have come out that have just talked about all that stuff, because you can kind of reflect back to how you felt as a kid, but now can fully appreciate why that was so monumental just in hockey in general, but especially for us here in the United States and, and the development of hockey as a sport um, and where it, you know, where it kind of finally started growing here. And, and um, it's been really fun to kind of go back and, and share those experiences with, you know, my own memories of the event and having more appreciation for it as an adult. Well, there's a reason it was given the uh, moniker of greatest sports moment of the 20th century. And, uh, you know, again, you're another, you're another example of why that is. Um, I do want to turn it just to give the audience some context. Again, we said in the open, you're the associate coach in chief for goaltending in the Mich Michigan Amateur Hockey Association. Can you just talk about what that role entails? Because uh, I think that'll give some good perspective on how we approach the episode. Absolutely. Um, I'm that I'm, it's great that I have the opportunity to talk about that. It's something I'm super passionate about. Um, as an associate coach in chief for goaltending, mainly um, we have a, we have a number of things that we're trying to do. Uh, first of all, of course, is is trying to grow grow the the position at the grassroots level, giving more kids the opportunity to play goal. Um, there's some really great uh, what we call quick change goalie gear mm -hmm. out there that's uh, made by my frenemies over at Vaughn. <laughs> um, that, that is, it's really good stuff. You can get a kid in and out of it. And in, in just around a minute, um, the idea behind the quick change gear is the kids are in their full player gear and it goes right over their player gear. You have a padded Jersey, you have leg pads that go over the shin guards. Um, you have a catch and a block. Um, and, um, it's a great opportunity and it's something we got to push the grassroots level everywhere. Uh, one of the things, one of my other responsibilities is, is to help put on the bronze level and the silver uh, coaching clinics. Um, and the bronze level clinics are designed for all coaches, not goalie specific coaches, to really focus on how to better provide a quality environment for your goaltender as a coach. And then the silver is a higher level clinic that we provide for actual goalie coaches who are working with goaltenders. Um, last year we did it in Vegas, or we did our final session in Vegas. This year we just did it a few weeks ago in Boston, and we do an event there at the community level, which any community can do if you've got enough people committed to putting it on. And you can take thirty kids, forty kids, play three on three cross ice, and make sure that every kid in that hour and fifteen hour hour to hour fifteen minute session gets to try goalie for six minutes in a game. Love it. Um, and it's amazing. And any association can do it. We just need to give them the tools to do it. Um, and that's been one of the things, if you can get 40 kids in one session to try goalie, um, we're going to have a lot more goaltenders out there just because you see how much fun the kids have, but there's so many kids out there that never even get the opportunity to try it. Yeah. I think that quick change, uh, we talked to Dave Starman earlier about that too, as well. And I, I know Jason power, who's a good, uh, good buddy of mine too, uses, you know, just that, that, you know, understanding that the more goalies we can have in the system, uh, the better. And I think it, and it also, in, in my world, it discourages some kids from playing goalie that shouldn't be a goalie. Like, okay, yeah, try it, get out of it quickly and, and don't, don't ever look at it again. But I think the, 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 I think that the, the nice part for us was watching, I do, I do the, I do a Ranger learn the play program with like 68 kids in it. And I think we've had almost 20 something kids play goalie. And out of that group, because of the quick change gear, uh, they've been able to migrate into, um, like, I don't know why every pro shop in the whole country doesn't give quick change gear away for free. Cause every kid that tries goalie wants all the gear. Like they might, yeah. like, Oh, well I like that, but I love that. And I think yeah. that's, you know, for us to have, I mean, we're beating kids down now on Saturday mornings because we only need six goalies and we have 12 or 15 that want to play. And it's uh, you know, so that's a good problem to have, but I think it's, it is a great model um, because now we're seeing, you know, you see that gap, right. And, and you probably see it more Brad than anybody that, like all of a sudden they become, you know, that 12 U 14 U level. And because there wasn't a big base of goalies at any point, it, it all of a sudden that, that pool gets really, really small. Yeah. And, and then you start seeing kids with the you wheel, know, maybe, and, maybe they just have one goalie or they, they just have two really, you know, goalies that weren't, maybe weren't the right kids to be in the net early on. Um, and then all of a sudden you find that out too late. And that's been the biggest thing. And, and you mentioned you know, hockey stores, pure hockey also has their own line of, 
of quick change gear. Um, the Vaughn stuff actually was like a newer generation version of it, kind of a 2.0. And it's, it's my understanding Pure Hockey's working on a, another version of their own as well. They don't give it away for free, but it is an easy and very economical resource. And the thing about USA Hockey too is we have uh, what's called the One Goal Grant, um, where associations every year they can submit uh, an application for some grant money, which comes from the fees from their district. And they can apply for things like the quick change gear, the intermediate size nets, which is another big thing with the young level of goaltending is that, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to be playing full ice with eight-year-old kids and putting eight-year-old kids in full size nets because it's not proportionate um, for their development. And, um, you know, they're not saying that there's not a time and place for full ice. I know how controversial that is with eight U's. There's some parents that never buy into it. But the reality is, at the end of the day, when you when you put eight U's on a full sheet of ice, you got a couple of kids that are clearly the ones that have been skating since they're five, skating around everybody else. And then the other ones that are trying to catch up, never, never can catch them, never, never uh, touch the puck for an hour. And uh, you don't develop if you don't touch pucks. And the same thing with the goalies, you throw them in this little, in this huge net. And you got these couple of kids that have been playing for three years and it's the first time they're trying the position and they get scored on eight times by one kid. You know, it's not a proportional environment for development. It doesn't help us to encourage young kids to play net. Um, and uh, that's why those intermediate size nets are so important. And the quick change gear is so important. So you're, it's a proportional environment for their development and it's giving every kid the chance at any time to at least try the position and see if it's for them. Yeah. And we've talked about it from a shooter's perspective too, right? It's a real, target it's not a fake yeah. target it's not this bs oh let you have you you, yep. you never have you know another eight feet of space to shoot on in a, in real hockey so why don't we make it look like real hockey have you guys you uh your, your i'm sorry correct. i was gonna say have you ever seen the video that usa hockey did where that's the adults playing out on the pond hockey yeah, it's awesome the, it's awesome the, that's great video showed it to a ton of parents um yeah. at those younger levels when I, i'm like just watch this video and let me know if you feel the same way about it and and it usually hits pretty close to home. It's a great video. I, I so now, it. now, now, uh, conversely, though, I watched those four years ago. I, I, when we were doing live coaching education programs, I had a great video of a kid. So in a in an intermediate net, not a great goalie, knew that the players couldn't lift the puck, won the game, <laughs> but laid on the ground, laid across the net the whole time, like laid there across the net. And the coach, I mean, the, the parents were loving it. I mean, it was the greatest uh, spectacle I've ever seen. I'm like, whoa, 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 we're going backwards here, guys. This is, I know you won and the kid felt good. You know, I think a couple of pucks hit him, but nobody could get the puck over him anyway. So he yeah. strategized, said, well, I'm just going to lay here. And, uh, you know, and this net's smaller. So again, it all, it all depends the on how creativity we of kids. Ourselves. But, hey, but the bottom, he did win. And, uh, you know, the team won 20 to nothing. So I think it was, it was definitely a winner on their side. But I think it's it, – it, but you're absolutely right. It just gives – I mean, you, you, you hit on the point that it gives more opportunity for more kids to experience something that normally a lot of parents would be like, well, well I can't play goalie. Like, it's just too expensive. Like, you want me to invest in all this? And then he finds out he doesn't like it? No, no, no. We're just saying we're going to actually really screw you. We're going to have you ha – we're going to have them love it. And then you're gonna have to go buy him equipment, like so. So then it's like, like, oh my god! And, you know, and I think in Lee's experience in this with his own kid now, right? Is that that you know, like, oh no, 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 you really actually like this, and you're pretty good at it. This is this is now. I got to rethink what I'm well, doing. And I, we took our time. So d just the quick progression of my kid was, you know, he he was curious <laughs> about playing it, and then he played it. And the first game he played, he you know, worst thing that could have happened, he had a shutout. And I'm I'm obviously <laughs> being sarcastic. Um, and then he wanted to try again and again and again. So we 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 gradually kind of put his gear together. I'm going to ask a question about that actually in a minute, Brad. You know, I'll, I'll say a few things. One is this: going back to the things we've talked about so far. You know, for the most important position on the ice, we don't take a lot of time with teaching people about it outside of the people actually in the net. It's one of the reasons we made this podcast was because we realized that you know, hey, just stop the puck is really not good instruction. Um, it's got to go beyond that, right? Uh, little things like. Goalie's got to be the best skater on the team. Goalie's got to see the game differently. Oh. Players who play goalie but don't end up as a goalie see the game differently. You learn how to do it. So we wanted to create much more conversation on that. I, I was also going to say that I think most of the parents that want mites to play full ice with full nets, they, they're the type of people that walked up hills both ways to school. Um, and we're taught in the school of hard knocks. You know, it's it's proportionately a much better game for mites when you have those intermediate nets and an appropriate ice service. Um, as a coach, 
and we actually saw this in my kids game yesterday. We don't ever want to be in the game where a team wins 30 to 12. It's not fun. It's not developing. And yeah, you know, get a kid scores 10 goals and don't get me wrong. We're not trying to pick on the kid. I mean, he's doing what he's got to do. Yeah. Right. It's just, it's just, what are we doing for all the other kids in that situation? Uh, you know, especially the, the little goalies. So let me, let me jump back to the equipment um, question, just since I allude, alluded to it. So I, again, my son's about to be nine. He's obsessed with the position. Uh, I saw that look in his eye and it took me about three months to build out his, his first set of equipment. And we started by using the team pads. We didn't have a, a quick change gear. Uh, and by the way, Mike, Dave Starman said that whoever invented that should be in the hall of fame. I think that was his exact oh, yeah. Yeah. Quote, but uh, yeah, we started with team pads. Then I got him a very affordable use set of pads from another parent. Um, and then it evolved into a goalie helmet for the holidays and so on and so on. Um, and I've gotten actually a lot of contradicting advice from people that have watched him from, hey, you should take him to a goalie coach to you shouldn't take him to a goalie coach. Um, uh, but this is what I know. I want to set you up for this one, Brad. Is I know, I know that he loves it. Okay. He loves to play that position. He is driven in that position. Um, and I, I, in a way that I haven't seen him yet in his life, keeping in mind that he's about to be nine, that's not lost on me. Mm -hmm. Is there any advice you would give a parent in my position? Cause I think there's a lot of parents out there in that position right now. Absolutely. Uh, it's actually one of the more common conversations I have when I'm wearing my associate coach in chief of goaltending hat, um, in Michigan and with USA hockey. And it's, it's, you got to continue to encourage them to have that passion, but also balance that with making them understand that we don't recommend position specialization and goal until 10 or 11 at the earliest. Right. Meaning we want them to play goal, but they absolutely need to continue to skate out. Um, they learn to, to see the game. They gain that a much better of that hockey knowledge that we need goaltenders to have. And more importantly, they're skating. And as goalie coaches, we can see when we get kids at 12, 13 um, that we're working with as goalie coaches and they have that passion and and they're super fired up and they work really hard, but we're still teaching them edge work and we're still teaching them shuffles and T-glides and they're struggling with them and things like that. That's when we can see goalies that we knew, like as soon as they said, mom, dad, I want to be a goalie. Mom and dad were like, okay. And they were okay with the kid playing goalie 24 seven, right. they were getting them private lessons, which at the younger levels, they do work on the skating and the movement, but it doesn't, it doesn't work on their overall abilities to, to or it's not as a set or not as effective with their overall skating abilities and learning the game as continuing to play the game, not only in the goaltending position. And some of the parents say, that's a really hard conversation for me to have my kid. How do I tell my kid he can't? It's, and it's easy. Like if you really love this and right. you really want to be good at it, you got to do this too. And yeah, I love that you bring that up. I, I want to say this because, because my son skated out yesterday and he was a little bummed that he was going to skate out. Keeping in mind too, it's not like he's fighting for a number one position here. This is just mm -hmm. my hockey. And mm -hmm. I remember he, he was a little bummed and I said, Hey, you know what, buddy, you're not asking the right question right now. What you should be asking is how can playing out make you a better goalie? If you're really passionate about it, that's the way you'll approach it. And he took it on totally. And, and, and he had a great game. But the, the point was, is that I, as you said, how could you fully understand that position if you don't understand the other positions? How how can you understand how a defenseman's supposed to play if you've never been on a two-on-one or uh, if you've never had to catch the puck on a breakout as a winger? Um, all of these things play into a goaltender's mindset, I'm assuming, right? I, I, I mean, I'm not a goalie myself, but understanding the chess match that is hockey and understanding the flow of the game has got to make you a better goaltender. Absolutely. And then also like you, you already said it, but having those conversations with them too, you know, he's, if he scores a goal, you can have that conversation when you sit down and say, okay, what did you see? Um, how you were able to score that goal? Like right. how were you able right. to score it? What did you see when you looked at the goaltender and then, well, if, flip the roles. If you were in net, you know, what would you have done to prevent yourself from scoring in that situation? And if you can start getting the start thinking like that at young ages too, then it's a little bit easier to, to, to convince them that, yeah, this is for your development as a goalie by us making you not play goal. Right. And, and it's, it also kind of plants that seed of, and this goes well beyond hockey, but we'll keep it specific for goaltending right now, but just to kind of be curious about how to get better at things, right. The, the, the goaltending position is glorious when you win, right. It's, it's, it, it's tough to have a, you know, 
in, 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 well, I guess in all the positions you can have a great game and still lose, but it's a little different in the net, right? I mean, cause it's still a loss. So the ability to learn how to question things and see things of, okay, this went well, this didn't go well. How can we be accountable towards learning? Um, I don't think it's ever too early to teach kids that. Um, in fact, I think we wait till it's far too late most of the time. Well, when they're teenagers, they'll understand that. Con- you can teach accountability immediately as soon as they start in Adams. Um, they might not pick it up right away. It might take 45 times telling them, but they'll pick it up sooner or later. Mike, let me throw it to you. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think I think when the, the average fan, when they watch like a goaltender at the NHL level or major juniors or college and they see them out like getting the skate, like and they get like those open sessions where they're just out there wheeling around and stick handling the puck and shooting like, oh, my God, this guy's like really good, like a good like it looks like a hockey player. Right. And I think that's where, you know, we want to get our younger kids to see more of that. Like, look at when you see this kid go out on, uh, and he's playing, you know, I, I've seen that with our better goaltenders at the high school level and they go out there and play pond hockey. You wouldn't even know they were the goaltender for the team. Like they're out there wheeling and dealing and right. skating and pivoting and turning. And, you know, so they're doing all the things. If they need, I know I played goalie till I was like 12 years old and I always loved going from goal to player. Like I always thought it was a great, cause that back then you had the old, you know, Cooper leather pads and their weight, yeah, they weighed like, pounds. Yeah. yeah. So you'd be like, Oh geez, this is great. Like I feel like I'm the lightest person in the world right now, but I think it's just a matter of you, know, you get that opportunity to skate, get that opportunity to play in net. And you can, if you can do that for as long as you can, it's hard, right? I mean, we, it's just hard. You get on a travel hockey team and, going to be real hard to not you know to divvy up you know the financials of okay well if you're going to be the second goalie or one of two goalies do i carry 16 kids or 18 kids or 14 kids so that's kind of stuff you have to work through with your organization but i think the more you can stay in the game and if you can be less kids sitting on the bench and more kids playing and if that means somebody's switching goalie to player then that's a great uh you know a great aspect to have on your team for sure well, at, at Goalie Nation, uh, which is what we what we call our our goalie gurus in USA Hockey, um, you know Steve Thompson's Gort, you know his his new hat trick is is a a shutout, a goal, and an assist. That's the new Gordy. You know, so every kid at the white level they play goal for one period, you know, some games, and they get a shutout in that period, and then they go and they score and they get an assist, and that's the new that's the new hat trick. So, and the other thing I did want to like you mentioned the stick too, like. We don't like some of the times I'll go do those. We'll do what's called a tri goalie for free event, which is where we go and we set up something similar to what I described earlier, but you just have kids show up and they know they can go out and try goalie with that quick change gear. I'll go to an association and they'll have the quick change gear. And then they got a stack of like might goal sticks. And I'm like, I don't even want those. Like, I don't want to put those in the kids' hands because those sticks are so big, clunky, heavy. Mm -hmm. These little kids, it doesn't (laughs) help them. And, you know, another thing, when you talk about the goalies going out and wheeling and handling the puck, that's another thing we can see in goalies at 11, 12, and 13, that we know that they specialized in goalie only because they cannot handle a puck with a goal stick because they really haven't developed those skills of stick handling, shooting, you know, passing all those things. If you can't do it with a player, you know, if you didn't work with it, a player stick, you sure in the heck can't do it with a really heavy, clunky goal stick. Yeah, they don't even know what the, the 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 they don't even know the structure of the stick handle. Like they don't know how it even feels. So you're right. I mean, and you see it all the time. And even even all the little nuances of of what USA Hockey's been doing a great job of, of introducing, like even paddle size and yep. just just making sure that you okay. Just make sure you're appropriate. Like, like Lee said it earlier. Don't buy up. Like don't say, oh well, when he is a goalie at 14, I want to save the 250. So let me get him a stick when he's going to be 14. Now at eight, he'll grow into it. And I think it's just, and, and, and so many people think this way and it's shock. It's actually shocking to me because it's, it's as you, you, even, and cause even people that are, you know, quote unquote athletes, even people that played the sport and I'm like, well, yeah, but all the money you're spending on all the lessons and the teaching isn't going to help you anyway, because you're using the in, improper. Right. Equipment. You know, so it's just my, like, Mike, what are you going to go with this? There's other ways to save because I think what happens is when we say that to parents, well, I'm trying to save money. There's other ways to save. I say, don't go cheap on your helmet. Don't go cheap on your skates, most likely. Everything else, there's probably a very, very good used option that's sized correctly, depending on the level, depending on the age, right? I, I get to a certain level, you want the new stuff. But there's other ways to save right. monies than, hey, you know, my kid's eight and he can use this stick till he's 12. Like, that's not realistic, <laughs> right? No. Um, in any way, not to mention, it, it, it's funny you brought up the stick because that was one of the other things we had to change with my kid. We had a senior stick cut down um, and he couldn't even get in the butterfly 
correctly yeah. because it was so big. So um, oh, his coaches, this is why I love this, this, this team where his coaches got him a, a shorter stick and I mean, a shorter paddle size so that he could appropriately drop. I mean, there was an awareness of it, um, which, and I still think it's too heavy for him, but he's, he's building that strength uh, while we're on equipment. Uh, great question for you here, right? Most skaters uh, find their equipment at a pure hockey or an equivalent. Uh, you know, you can go in, you can try it on and you got it. I imagine dressing a goaltender is much more in depth than that. Uh, and, and so I'm going to expand this question the way I have it written. I said, could you share some insight on what goes into preparing pads for elite goalies today? But it really, it's not just elite goalies, right? Talk about sizing, talk about, you know, how do you fit a goalie properly since we're on the topic? Okay. Um, it's not, I mean, it's not rocket science, but it also isn't, uh, it also isn't just general knowledge that you can very easily go in and do it. And um, I actually have a PowerPoint presentation which uh, I, I can provide you guys a link where your listeners can go and download. And I've actually got slides where it shows exactly what to look for in fitting pads, fitting gloves and blockers, fitting chest protectors, pants. And there's also a, a small little section on sticks and the, the paddle length as well. Um, it is hard for a lot of people because there are, like you mentioned, there are people who live close to a, you know, a pure hockey or a piranhas or a goalie monkey or any of the hundreds uh, mm -hmm. and thousands of small mom and pa shops all across the United States that actually do invest in goalie and not all hockey shops do. And that's the problem. You also have a lot of kids out there and parents where they don't live anywhere close to a shop that they can run into yeah, um, to Amazon. Just buy stuff on. <laughs> yeah. And I, I tell you, I, I have a lot of conversations with parents where I say, you know, what are your, what are your vacation plans you have this summer and where are you going? And then go ahead and look ahead and, and, and chart it out and then uh, make that part of your vacation right. of stopping at that, you <laughs> know, that, that t-shirt hockey or piranhas <laughs> or wherever you are. How do you know you're um, a hockey parent? Well, right, we plan our exactly. vacations like, around going to a, a pro shop. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, because goalie, Good yeah. goalie you mentioned problem. like fit is so important. Right. And if you're just clicking on the internet, it's really hard. So you do, there, you have a lot of resources online you can go to that help you through that process. Um, and so, and obviously all the places, if you order something and it comes in, um, and it's not right, you can ship it back and they cover all that. Um, but fit is, is uber important. And you, you brought up, you know, the, the, the prohibitive cost of goaltending. And when I go speak at goalie schools and get up on my soapbox about a number of the issues, one of them is as a U.S. sales manager of Brian's, I love it when you go out and buy the shiny, shiniest, newest, greatest looking goalie gear. But until your kid's close to done growing, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be buying used gear. Right. There's so much used gear out there. Every parent that has a growing kid playing goal is in the same boat that if it's properly fitting, they may get a year, max two seasons out of something. And even if you're getting two seasons, your kid either didn't hit that spurt in that area of the body that they're outgrowing, or you probably got it too big in the beginning to be able to do that. And you've got sideline swap. You have tons of social media goalie parent sites um, and Facebook and other social media avenues where every year you can just throw the stuff out there, get some money back from what you spent and then buy something that fits them properly. And I would far rather you buy the properly fitting used gear than that brand new set of pads your kid really wants because their favorite goalie wears it, which is irrelevant to how they play the game. Um, you know, and then, but, but get it too big because you have to get two years out of it for the amount of money that you're justifying spending on their, their sport. So here's, here's a cool follow-up for you. Again, you know, I'm thinking as a hockey parent myself and please, I'm going to kind of make an assumption. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. Okay. Um, my assumption is this, is that the newest gear, and I, I'll just kind of keep it like in a, maybe a 10 year time frame, right? Maybe five or less, but the newest gear does not have as much of an advantage to the goalie being a better goalie as people think. And what I'm saying that is, is with the used gear, my attitude is this, I'm getting my kids used gear because he's got to learn the position. It's the, the new gear is not going to affect his ability to make the save as much as it's probably looking like. And I'm not trying to take a shot at the companies in any way. I'm, I'm just trying to support my, my point or your point, excuse me, that I don't need the shiniest gear for him to excel at being goalie. Right. Nope. Yeah. No, you don't. Um, I, I would put the caveat there to the definition of newest gear versus used gear. Uh, there are some significant technology changes that have occurred over 
you know, the last decade now. Well, and, and tell us about them. Go up from, where go you're to moving away from yeah. leather strapping into elastic strapping. Brian's was the first company with what we call our smart strapping system, which was the going fully elastic. And pretty much every company now is copied. You do have some of the other companies are still doing leather straps on stock pads, like in the, the E-Flex line with CCM or because those traditional hybrid goalies at the higher level, some of them still want that. But the reality is, is when these goalies actually force themselves to try elastic strapping, um, they really do transition. And Carter Hart's a good example of it. When he moved over to our gear this year, you know, we, we put the leather straps from his older style or the pads he was wearing from the previous manufacturer. And after being in our gear for a little while, he's like, I don't need these anymore. And <laughs> next, next set, take the leather straps off. But I still have a lot of pro goalies that still want leather straps regardless. And that some of them have a mix and match of both. It really comes down to preference there. But in the conversation of youth goalies, if you go too old, there is performance. There are performance. I believe again. that. I do believe there's, that. Yeah. There's yeah. more stability in the butterfly, the way the pads are built now. We use lighter and, and more high performing foams in our, in our gear, but anything within the last five years, eight years, whatever, you know, you're not, you're absolutely correct in what you said. It's when you're buying that like 15 year old set of, you know, shorter pads, they don't have higher right. than thigh rise with thigh boards still laced in and all leather strapping. Not only are you missing out on some of the technology, it's frustrating to put those, those, those pads on for right. kids when the kid next to them, just like bang, bang, bang with, you know, three or four Velcro straps and they're in yeah. and out of their gear. I, I'm experiencing that in real time because the, the team set we had was leather straps. And I was like, man, this is a, I'm sweating putting this stuff on. And then the, the new set we have is, is just click, click strap. Yep. And then there's one under the foot, but it's like, wow, that's a lot easier than, than, yep. than putting that on. So, so I, I already see what you're talking about. And, and um, like you said, yes, yeah, so look, sometimes those old, the old ways are tough to break because it's just in green. Oh, this is the way we've always done it. But when there's a better way to do it, it as you said, and this, this goes beyond hockey too. It will not take you long to figure it out if you're not stubborn, that there's a better way to do things. Right. But yeah, yeah let, let's keep going. I didn't mean to kind of cut you off from just the leg pads and that's one aspect of it, but like, let's talk about skates and, and chest protectors, helmets. I mean, cause there's so much that goes into this. Um, I do want, I'm going to show something on here, but this is also, sure. um, this is also in the PowerPoint, um, again, that, that we'll share the Dropbox for. Yeah. And for the, everybody listening to this, if you're not in a position to watch this, we will share this in our show notes. And, and if you can get over to YouTube and watch it, this will be on screen as well. So when you're talking about catch glove, I don't want to, I don't want to get away from catch gloves because the most common thing you hear out in the street on catch gloves is uh, my kid can't close the glove. And how, you know, why are gloves made so stiff? Why is it so hard to break the glove in? And the reality is 95% of the time is not because the glove is too stiff and they can't break it in. It's that it's too big for their hand. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm sharing this one slide is because if you cannot get your hand into the glove and then keep it where the break of your hand is over the break of the glove, you're never going to be able to close it properly. And we have that problem with, with youth players. Um, we at, at Brian struggled with it where we offer uh, what's called a pro glove with intermediate internal. So it's, it's senior pro size, but it has a smaller internal for smaller hands, which was what we would put our tier one and our collegiate female goaltenders in. But even with that glove, even though they could get it tight on the back of their hand, they still weren't getting their hand all the way in the glove a lot of the times. And therefore, they really struggled with breaking those gloves in where we put them on the break-in machine. We have a hydraulic machine in our factory that breaks gloves in. Um, they still were sending it back for us to put it on the break-in machine. And then we introduced what's called Intermediate Pro, which is everything about it is pro. We still make it in Canada, just like where we make all of our, our pro retail stuff. And But it's two inches smaller in circumference. So mm -hmm. they can actually get their hand in over the break. And I, I got into a back and forth in a real world with a, with a customer out there who bought a pro with intermediate internal for his son. And we were going back and forth and he was saying like, he couldn't break it in. It's, you know, for me to spend this kind of money, yada, yada, yada. And I went back and forth and I finally got out of him after three emails. He didn't tell me until his kid's nine. <laughs> and, and his whole thing was, he's like, well, with the smaller glove, he's getting beat up. He's getting beat up top. And I was like, 
And the unfortunate part about this conversation with me is you're not just talking to the U.S. sales manager, Brian, you're also talking to an associate coach and chief of goaltending with, <laughs> with Michigan and USA right. Hockey. And I can tell you absolutely a bigger glove is not helping your kid make more saves, be more efficient. Right. Um, it, you need to focus on the fundamentals and something that fits. And bigger is not better in goal. And so buying the bigger pad, buying the bigger glove and blockers, buying a chesty that's a size too big, it's not going to help your kid be better in net. It's just going to hinder their development and their movement and their enjoyment of playing the position. Um, you know, you, you bring up chest and arm. It's super important that you take time to try and adjust and measure, you know, adjust the arm, shorten, lengthen them, whatever, really take the time when you're at the store trying it on to really get them comfortable in it. Don't go, don't go into a, a hockey shop to try and goal equipment and be in a hurry. Um, yeah, you need to be prepared to spend time trying stuff on. You mentioned the stick. They really need to get in pads and skates to see where they are in their stance when they're going for a new stick to see if it is too short. It brings their blocker over their pads. If it's too long, it'll open up that six hole. It'll force that blocker away from the outside of the pads. Um, there is a video uh, from Pure Hockey on that PowerPoint that we'll share with your listeners that also a really nice short video that breaks that down on how to fit a goalie stick when you're when you're switching. I always say, you know, it's there's only a few factories in the world making goal sticks. Um, we all get them made in the same factories. They just have different brands on them, which the other frustrating thing about that is still the paddle lengths are so not universal. And so if you outgrow a 24 inch warrior goal stick, I tell people just buy the next size up in warrior. You don't need to change brands. The goal sticks in the same price points are really similar, but if you go from a 24 warrior and you just buy a 25 Bauer, because I think that you know, or the 25 Bryans, you know, because I think that's the next step up. It could be two inches different and force you out of that comfortableness in your stance. Um, so it's better to just scale up with the stick that you've been using. Right. That's a great point. And again, I want to remind everybody listening, we're getting pretty specific on the equipment here, but this is, as a coach, this is great knowledge for me because I want anybody in that net, especially the younger ages to feel good in that net. And I don't want them to be hindered because we didn't take a moment to just make sure the gear fits somewhat properly. Um, I wonder now, again, I said this, it's the most important position, but I think we spend the least amount of time on it as coaches. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn this a little bit of a different direction. We can totally come back to the equipment if you want. Um, but I want to know what you think are the questions or the strategies that youth coaches don't have, they don't ask, they don't know about that they should be implementing into their practices. And this is a question we'd like to ask on this specific episode every time, because uh, again, a lot of times we hear, well, it just stop the puck. It, it, we got to do better than that. <laughs> I'm, so what I'm, are your thoughts I'm on smirking, that? I'm smirking yeah. here because I, I'm, I love that this is the next area that we're going into. Um, right. So I mentioned earlier before the USA hockey clinics that we put on the, the bronze level clinic, which is a clinic that we put on, for any coach that wants to learn more about providing a, 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 an, an effective learning environment for their goaltenders. And we have a lot of really, really good content in there. It's a two-day online course. It's now part of the USA Hockey's Coaches Continuing Education Program. Um, again, I've mentioned Steve Thompson's name. He's the ADM manager of goaltending for USA Hockey. Uh, one of his goals immediately in establishing and, and when we kind of re-went over our curriculums for these clinics was ultimately to have one bronze level certified coach on every coaching staff. Doesn't have to be a goalie coach, but one coach who's gone through and taken that bronze level certification. And the one thing I, I say, if we can walk out of that clinic, that every coach remembers one thing out of all the great information is the practice planning part of it. And that is just saying quite simply, you need to think about your goaltender and the drills that you're putting on on the ice before you finalize that practice plan. And what we say is that there's not a single drill that you're doing right now that you can't modify and make it game-like for the goaltender and make it fun and make it you know, repetitive without repetitiveness. All the things that we say at USA Hockey are important for practice drills, but make that for your goaltender. So the era of coaches who are like, I gave my goalie the 15 minutes at the beginning of practice with my goalie coaches. Now they're in that and they're puck dummies, the rest of practice. And there is not a single drill you do as a coach that you can't just spend an extra five minutes modifying to make sure that you're getting just as much 
out of it for your goaltender as you are for your forwards and defense. If we can get every coaching staff to do that in their practice plans, we're there. We're where you're talking about going. We're, we're, we are at a youth hockey level now providing a, a markedly better environment for our goalies. We're going to see more goalies stay in the position. We're going to get more kids to try the position. If as coaches, we aren't neglecting our goalies in any of the drills. And it's just about a little bit more work on our coach, on us as coaches, when we're planning those practice plans and looking at those drills and going, wait a minute, in this drill, I got the goalie taking a shot here and making a save. And then before maybe they can get reset, they're going over here and they might be getting another shot. It's not game like, doesn't happen. Right. I'm going to tweak this. I'm still, it's still a great drill for everybody else, but now it's a great drill for my goalies. Yeah, it's I, think, a great I, think point. I think it's just, and I think it just reiterates too, that you're teaching you're, what you're doing for your goalies is helping your players. I mean, the fact that you don't allow players to finish the play and you ask a player, shoot the puck and wheel to the corner without like that goalie finishing their, their, their save. And then the player not finishing their rush to the net and creating that havoc in front and creating, you know, getting that clear sighted, you know, analytic studies out of the way and, and making sure you're, 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 you know, getting over the Royal road and you're finishing at the net. It's, it's, it goes both ways. So I think I've, I've definitely appreciated, you know, what we've done from the, from the coaching education program in getting, you know, your average coach to understand that if you teach your goalies better and more consistent, you know, game like scenarios it is helping your players it's not they're not mutually exclusive they're working together but uh, you know and even to the point where like i remember uh my college goalie used to get so upset i mean i i, I won't mention his name because <laughs> I, I don't want i don't i don't want i don't want him going after any of his ex-teammates but like if he saw if a kid shot the puck out of the corner during the drill and he was in net playing goal against somebody he'd he'd lose his mind he'd take uh, you know i'm like this doesn't he's going to stick a stick and put it right across your head in a minute. And I, I'm really don't have anything to say about it. Cause what are you doing? Like, why are, why do you think he's just a, you know, if you're, if he's a shooting target to you, then, then that's, that's not a great thing for us. And I think that's the point is like that goal is in a specific place. And we, the only way we're going to help us be a better team is to make sure he could be the best goalie. How do we do that? Well, we put him in game like scenarios. Right. And then if you can get a goalie that's in those situations where you can't score on them, now your players are going to get better. Because it's easy, right? It's easy for a player to score on a goalie that wasn't set and wasn't ready. You're like, oh, I feel good. I scored. <laughs> well, yeah, but you didn't. But what if, but it wasn't even realistic. Like well, So, it, so yeah. I think that's – but that's that's a really hard thing for coaches to structure in their head because they're never thinking – well, <laughs> we're, we're already not thinking like, okay, how do we make it game-like, yeah. right? And then we're not thinking, well, how do we make a game like – oh, and, and, and the fact is we actually have a goalie in the net during games. Like, yeah, so and, it's that whole, it's that whole piece of, is it, does it really need to be that difficult? And I would say, you know, based off of what Brad does with, with the, the coaching education program in these, in these different level goaltending courses. Now there is no excuse. There's every practice plan in the world that incorporates goalies. It doesn't, it doesn't not exist anymore. So there's no excuse to be like, well, I'm really not sure what I should do with them. No, no. There, right. there is no, there is no questioning about it anymore. The other thing that, and you'll know this too, Mike, is that, that one of the things that I, I love about the new curriculums and as the, the curriculums the last couple of years have developed, you know, I'm mentioning the, the bronze and silver, which are the goalie specific focus, but in our level one, two, three, and four, we have a lot, you know, we've built that into the content of challenging coaches yeah. um, to not forget about the goalies in all these different steps of their development as coaches um, we don't leave that out of the conversation where it used to be, it wasn't that it was out of the conversation, but it was kind of left up to the districts when they were doing their coaching education, whether they were providing goalie specific content or not. Now there's goalie specific content throughout all of the curriculum. So all of these coaches are getting exposed to challenging them to, to do these things. You don't have to take the bronze level, but I certainly would love for more, more of the, the parents and coaches out there to take the bronze level course and really kind of understand what we're trying to do with kids now. Um, to encourage their development, get more kids to stay with the position. Well, and I'm going to add this too. Again, we keep saying this. It's the most important position on the ice uh, for a team in a competitive environment, right? I, again, I think when you get to the younger levels, this is much more about having fun and just development in general. But you'd, you'd think <laughs> with that in mind that as a coach, uh, you'd want to invest more time into this. And here's another thing I'm thinking about, right? Uh, you always have these parent volunteers. That's a great thing to, to delegate. If you don't think you have the time or, or the time to do you want to do it, you know, let a parent take that course and help your goalies out. Then they're on the ice. 
Um, uh, you know, assuming the demeanor is there, right? That's something everybody's got to gauge uh, individually. But I'm a big believer, and Mikey alluded to this, that uh, great goalies make better shooters, better shooters make great goalies, and that it has to be reciprocated. And it's funny because, again, I'm experiencing this in real time. I remember uh, the first couple of times my son was on the ice, and, and to the audience, I always appreciate you letting me talk about my kid because it's like I'm, 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 I'm walking through this. Um, but I remember the first time he was on the ice, uh, he couldn't pick a puck to save. And I'm just, I'm just kind of becoming conscious that like, oh, wow, this, this is not going to work, right? He really needs to understand how to focus on a shot. Yeah. And, and, and then like you said, one puck. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember the one time we, he was out there with, um, and again, he was just kind of out there with the Adams to help his sister and all of them were on the net. And I saw his eyes. I've never seen his eyes shift like that. Um, it was like he was in REM sleep um, because he didn't know what to do. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa Logan, just pick a puck. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Um but it's one of those things of even in development, I have seen goalies not I'll, I'll just say not in my practices, but leave the ice because they're so appalled at the way the practice has been set up by the coach. Um, this is at the higher levels that they're not getting shots, they're just standing there um, and they want the work too. So the point I'm trying to make, Brad, to your point, Mike, to your point is that it behooves you to take a few extra minutes, if not hours, to make sure that they're incorporated, to communicate with your goaltenders of, you know, what do you need to work on right now? Um, and as you said, make it a game situation. There, there, there's nothing worse than, than, you know, okay, every shot today came right down the middle of the ice in a breakaway format. Um, and, and the kid deked from the warm up on, you know, the goal is not going to get, it's just going to be discouraging. And, and at worst, they might get injured just because they're not playing it the correct way. So the that's, other important, that's, yeah, yeah, the other important thing about that. And I, I, I wish I had mentioned this earlier is also because you brought up the private lesson conversation and you brought yeah. up when is it the right time? And that's really an individual decision. Like you're not going to not benefit from, from that with goalie development, even at the younger ages, although I would argue that at eight, nine, you don't necessarily have to have that yet, but the, when you do have it, that relationship also needs to be symbiotic. Mm -hmm. with the coaches of the team that you're playing on. And that also can be a challenge if the coaches don't aren't open to it and don't put in the work to do it. So if you have a supplemental skills coach, and this is for any position, it's not just for goaltending, you have shooting coaches or skating coaches. And, and if they don't, they don't have that relationship with the coaches where they're not watching a game here or there to see how they're playing, or they don't know what drills they're doing, they can't necessarily be as effective as a skills coach for what those, those individual athletes need. And right. that's one of the struggles that we have where we really try to provide tools to our private goalie coaches to reach out and have those relationships. And we provide the, the regular coaches the tools to make sure that they force that communication so they can have those regular meetings. Like you're talking about, about saying, you know, what, what are they doing well right now? What are they still, do you feel they're still struggling with? So I can work that into my training and then I'll right. watch. And I'll let you know if I agree or disagree with with what you're seeing out there. Yeah, and, and one thing I'll shout out the coach of my kids team now. And, and and again, I'm not underselling how much I think this has helped my son. Is he is always communicating with me? Is Logan going to be in net today or not? Right. And then these are the three things I think he needs to work on as a goaltender. And then he'll he'll specifically make sure the drills. Not just about my kid, but he'll make the drills. So he has to work on these things. And this is a might level. And I really appreciate that he does that. All right. Um, again, he, my son also skates out, so this isn't just limited to him, but that that's a coach to me that kind of really gets it right. And understands that, you know, this, this is someone who's developing and we want to help him develop. And I think he's just as excited about my kid playing as my kid is, which as a parent is a really, really good feeling. Um, yeah, we had that, we had that with, uh, I mean, at that communication piece is so we had, uh, Jerry Wayman was part of our organization and, you know, he would put out a week. I mean, li literally he made sure that his staff and you know even at you know working with the pro level and working at all the national team kids and working at the level he was at he still made sure he took time to say okay all you youth hockey guys here's your coaches that are going to be there communicate with those coaches about how your practice is structured so that they can know when there's breaks in the action to talk to your goalie and when it's not going to affect you like in your practice, like we don't, we want to work. If we, if, if, if it's always like, Oh, oh, you'll get like, if you have a goalie coach that shows for your practice and you don't communicate with that goalie coach, what your practice plan is, 
then that person's just wasting their time because they don't know when the when they could jump in and what they should be looking for. If I have a plan, I'm like, oh, here's what they're going to be doing. You know, some tip in drills. This is probably a good time for me to preemptively talk about you know some of the things we need to know right, in right. a tip in drill. Like so, so that's I think where you know that communication piece and the fact that they're they're a player. They're not. They're oh, the goalie's got his own goalie coach. Well, no, no, the goalie coach is there to support you, coach. So get them involved. And then make sure that you're communicating with them what the plan is so that you can maximize if, in fact, you don't want to, you know, keep telling your goalies that, oh, you have to go out and get private lessons on your own. Oh, and by the way, the message you might be getting has nothing to do with the message I'm sending. Right. So it's just if you want right. that, if you, if you really want that, then you have to work together within that. So, order. Yeah, so for your listeners, um, Steve actually texted to our, our chat groups. That's what I was looking at right here. Um, there's an article in the Chicago Sun Times. You can Google it, where they are. Uh, and this is just recent, where they talk about the active interest that Luke Richardson is taking um, in the development of his goaltenders, and they they have the conversation with Jimmy Waite, who's the goalie coach in Chicago, about how it actually set. He was taken back a little bit by it of how involved Luke was getting as a head coach, and it is something at the higher levels that still it's yeah. it's still something that that we're struggling with and. We've talked about adding some content to the higher level coaching education at level four and level five to break down the barriers and finding that common, that common language between the goalie coach. And so you don't have the goalie coach as a buffer between the goalies and the coach. It's more of a translator and a mm. developer of that commonality and that having the same goals for the athlete, making sure that right. they're taken care of. That's a great, it's term. a really good article. If, if you're interested in those sort of things, I'd, I'd say grab it. And it's, you know, it's a five minute read and, and it's really kind of fascinating to see how it's changing at the NHL level too, in a good way. What should people search? You said Chicago sometimes. Chicago sometimes. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, yep. And it was just last week. I think it was in there. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, it's December 19th. There you go. We'll try and link that up with the episode yeah. too. No, I, and again, I love that you said translator. That's a really good way to look at it, not a buffer, right? Because again, it gets overlooked a lot. If you haven't spent a lot of time in the net, which I have not, you might not just be conscious to it because you're thinking the game from a different point of view. And again, when you've got 20 skaters to manage, you know, and two goalies, uh, yeah, yeah it's, that might that might skew how you view this, but they they all work symbiotically at the end of the day. And I think the, the great coaches will figure that out. Um, Brad, I want to turn the conversation again. Now, I always like to ask this in these episodes, just about the mental side um, of playing goalie, uh, especially as we rise up the ranks and, you know, and not to turn it too serious, but uh, we do know that there's mass problems with uh, teen angst, anxiety, um, uh, even to the ultimate, uh, you know, suicide level with some kids. So I do want to talk to you just about how you like to see um, youth athletes specifically approach the mental side of being in net because it's an unforgiving position. Uh, puck's going to go in the net. You've got to deal with it. You've got to compartmentalize your emotions and move forward. So what are your advices? Um, what is your advice, excuse me, on that, both from the athlete point of view and then also the parent point of view, right? About how do you handle your kid after the game when maybe they had a really bad game? Uh, or or a great game, whatever it is. But I want to know your your expert opinion on how to approach those two two places. A uh, couple of things, and and mental skill. There's so many great mental skills training resources out there, and and I'm certainly not an expert in that area, and I definitely do defer. Um, but I I definitely so my first thing recommendation would be to absolutely do some research on mental skills training at every age level. There's some age age appropriate resources too. I think it's very important at the younger ages that we teach them when we talk about that focus of fun and that we're playing a game mm -hmm. to never ever lose focus of that. And your 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 best mentally strong goalies that are at the young age are able to adapt to the fact that goals are going to happen and goals are a learning experience for us to become better. They're not a a something that happened that cost us the game, something that happened that shows me that I'm not not where I need to be as a goaltender. Another thing we can do at the youth levels is to really encourage the teams to stop charting shots on goal and save percentages and goals against average for young kids. Because first of all, it's parents doing it. So they're not doing it accurately anyways, because they're right. not professional. He had 72 you know, like, shots last game. What are you talking about? At the professional about? levels, there's somebody whose job is to chart right. shots. That's what they do for a job. So they're pretty good at it, even though they make mistakes. 
but you know, I've, I've had it at the youth level. Um, I'm currently coaching a 14 U team and, and, uh, you know, last year I had a, a, a goalie dad who kept coming up to me with the save percentage and shot and wanted to talk to me. And I was like, first of all, she absolutely didn't face that many shots. Um, second of all, like, this is not going to help her development. Um, we're focused on, you know, what we need to do to, to make her a stronger goaltender right now, goals against average, save percentage, those metrics are not part of her development. And I think at the young levels, especially, this is way too, and especially because the websites, they put it up on the websites for youth hockey. And so you right. kind of can't get away from it. And as coaches, we need to try. Um, because at those young levels, that is not the way you want these goalies to gauging their success. Because especially at the younger levels, you're probably going to have higher scoring games and games where they play great. And it's just part of the development of their whole team as a whole. Um, so we really need to train them on that and really, really encourage it at the young levels that everything is a learning experience in the game. And if it detracts from, from fun, you got to refocus. That's a great point. Um, and it's not going to be easy to do. Um, Cause there are those games that, you know, that, that you just can't sugarcoat what happened. We all have bad days. Yeah. And so it's then like that's plus minus too, about. right. It's like plus minus as a player. It, yep. it, and a and I mentioned, yeah, good. We're, we're training young quality human beings. These are life lessons um, and then the last thing I always talk to my parents about is they leave the games at the rink. Uh, I don't want it to be the entire car ride home. I don't want it to be the dinner table after you get home. You're allowed to talk to them about, did they have fun? What was fun about the game? If they, if you get some things out of that, that you think we need to address that they're not having fun, then we'll do that as coaches. But the last thing I want these kids doing when they leave the rink is continue to obsess about the goals against, um, or, but again, this is universal, all players, forwards, D, whatever, go home, get back to your regular life, do your homework, have fun with your brothers and sisters and parents, play games, whatever it is. Don't make a dinner table talk after the game, um, leave it at the rink and we'll get back to work at practice and, and focus on the things that we can do better. So we had a great episode, very popular episode called the car ride is not for coaching. Uh, which alludes to what you just said too. And, you know, yep. there's a, other few things I realized, especially at the younger ages, uh, when the game's over and they leave the rink, they're not thinking about the game. They're thinking about, you know, Xbox or YouTube or what they're doing next. And you, you got to let them have that freedom. Uh, I think as parents, sometimes it's, and we wanted, we should discuss this. No, let them be a kid because here's what happens. Um, and, and Brad and Mike, you can come in on this. If you implement at a young age that we need to analyze this, then we need to go over it. And that's what we do because when when we're playing hockey, we got to be the best. What do you think that manifests into when you're 17 or 18 years old? It's massive anxiety, overanalyzing, and then a fear of failing and that I'm going to be judged by what I do in net. And again, there is a time and a place to, to exercise that. It's not right after the game. And it should be if your kid wants to talk about it. I, I told Logan, my son, um, I said, if you ever want to talk about the game after the game, it, you let me know and we can talk. But I said, I will not bring it up, right? No matter good or bad, if you want to talk about it, it's up to you. So I just think that you, you plant these seeds inadvertently when they're young, because as adults, we're approaching it like adults. <laughs> and we want to know how to be better, right? And, and that's not a shot. That's that's how we think most of the time. But you're planting a seed that's going to manifest into something potentially devastating mentally for them when they get older. I think what kids need to hear after games and I get groans on this. I think kids need to hear. I love you. All right. I don't define my happiness with you by how you played the game today. Right. I tell my kid before every game, I love you. Don't care what happens out there. I'm going to love you when you're done. All right. I'm trying to instill a lack of fear to play because I want him to enjoy the game. And that's my soapbox moment, but yeah, you go feel, feel free to keep going Brad, Cause I think this is great stuff. Well, I just wanted one of the to play in exactly what you just said. Uh, one thing that I always remember, I was watching a video series of the '98 Finals when uh, the Wings swept Washington. And yeah, thanks for not using '97, by the way, as someone okay. in Philadelphia. I appreciate okay. that. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, Coach Ron Wilson said before the game, and it it didn't end up being the pregame talk that got him out of being swept, but. Um, he mentioned that I believe if I remember the phrase, it's Hanta Yo, which is a Native American yep. phrase for don't be afraid to die. Yeah. And as a coach, a youth hockey coach, it's always played into my mantra every day, all day long. Don't be afraid to fail and make mistakes. 
Right. And because they're inevitable and they're part of what we do as human beings and as athletes, we're going to make mistakes. If we're not afraid of those mistakes and we know that it's just part of our development, we're not going to get nearly as much anxiety as you're talking about that can be detrimental and can can overcome, overtake that fun, overtake our, our development because we're constantly worried about not being successful all the time. And if you can really ingrain into young athletes that not to be afraid of losses, mistakes, errors, all those things, if you're not afraid, you'll make less because you're going to spend more time about just, I always say something, you go and you make a mistake. As long as you're moving your feet, you can make up for that mistake. And, and they're just going to happen. Keep those feet moving, keep that engine going and, and get out there whether it be the rest of that shift or the next shift is a new shift. And um, it's the same thing with goaltending is that you're going to make mistakes or, or tips are going to happen that aren't even mistakes, but things that you don't have control over. You can't be afraid of those things because they're going to happen. And the, the, the earlier we learn that and we can ingrain it, um, I think the more success we'll have at, at avoiding some of the anxiety and, and the, the mental, the mental issues that we have of playing the position when we, when we're not playing well, and we go into our, you know, when we need to get that back. Well, and I'll take it a step further is to apply everything Brad just said to life. To because life. It, goes, it goes beyond the pipes. I, I know you know that. I'm just saying like, like so much of that position can be applied to life. And uh, I remember that Ron Wilson, I remember the video of him bringing that gigantic wooden Indian into the locker room and kind of Olaf Kolzig and they're just looking at him like, what are you doing? But uh, he had a way, he had a way uh, of getting people to do that. So um, no, this has been really great, Brad. I was going to say, I'm, I'm going to close it out soon, Mike. I want to know if you had any other additional questions. No, well, I have a ton, but you know, it's not going to fit in, <laughs> but I think, I think it's just, um, no, I, I think what Brad's doing, I think, you know, obviously from, from the equipment side to, uh, you know, the educational side to just mentoring, you know, other, other good young goalie coaches, is, you know, you think about, you know, 15, 20 years ago, they didn't have goalie coaches. Like you didn't even have anybody to mentor. Like nobody even thought like, oh, well, somebody should actually work with a goaltender, shouldn't they? Like, you know, so I think it's just great to see a positional uh, coach come into the fold and then then take it to a, just a whole nother level through, especially in the U.S., what we do here uh, with the different levels of of kind of goaltending education there is. Um you know, I think what USA Hockey's done to model after even the European system and the Finnish groups and a lot of these, you know, great goaltending uh, nations, I guess, you know, that that's really quickly becoming, well, that's the great goalie nation right there. I mean, they're the ones that are finding more goalies and more athletes to play goalie and having better athletes play goalie for longer periods of time. So I think, you know, obviously, Brad, what you're doing, uh, you know, not not only in your region, obviously, but across the country is uh is fabulous and, and you know we need more people like that thanks not uh, a Brad, question again i i i, I have a bad i have a bad i, yeah, I should ask more i should ask more questions on this podcast you should uh, you just should, have you, me have yeah. me back yeah Make we will we will I'll come back anytime <laughs> our kids play goal he's not going anywhere brad i just want to throw up <laughs> is there anything that you wanted to say before we close this out or any questions i didn't ask that you just want to kind of put out there no, I mean, this has been fantastic. I mean, I love the fact that you guys are out there doing this and and providing more research. One of the things I really have enjoyed about my job with Brian's being a smaller company, being more grassroots, it's really allowed me to get out there and interact with the end users a lot at goalie schools and goalie camps and and having these conversations with the parents, um, that equipment fit and and all of that is an important part of it. Um, and so just to be able to come on, on here with you guys and talk about it. So it's a resource for parents and coaches out there. And then, like I mentioned, I'll definitely provide you with a Dropbox link. Uh, for yes, the, please do. For the fit presentation. Then I'll also provide you the link on the coaching education side. So that bronze level course, so coaches who may be listening, or even like I said, the parents that want to learn more about what we're trying to do for their kids, they can take that two night course um, and, and learn more about it. And they're all, they're a lot of fun too. They're the clinics are fun. They're on zoom, but they're fun. Well, hey, listen, if it's not fun, what are we doing, right? The exactly. game, it's a game. It's supposed to be fun. I always joke about that. Remember the Titans, it's football is zero fun, sir. Right. There's a reason we all laughed at that, that scene. So 
Um, again, for our listeners, that's going to be available um, at ourkidsplayhockey.com. We'll make sure we link it with the episode. We'll probably also put it all over our Facebook page, Our Kids Play Hockey. Just look for that and you'll find us. Uh, Brad Johnson, fantastic guest on uh, this edition, man. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, I, I always learn from these episodes. I always imagine if I'm learning and Mike's learning, everybody's learning. So that's, uh, that's the purpose. So thanks for your time today. Thank you. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of Our Kids Play Goalie, a subset of Our Kids Play Hockey. Remember, all of our episodes, goalie or not, available uh, wherever you listen to podcasts or ourkidsplayhockey.com. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. We'll see you on the next edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Have a great day, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Make sure to like and subscribe right now if you found value wherever you're listening, whether it's a podcast network, a social media network, or our website, ourkidsplayhockey.com. Also, make sure to check out our children's book, When Hockey Stops, at whenhockeystops.com. It's a book that helps children deal with adversity in the game and in life. We're very proud of it. But thanks so much for listening to this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey, and we'll see you on the next episode.